Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A year old male, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorsteps, doorposts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water or roasted but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. For the word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 149. And we'll say it together. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their neighbours with chains of lion, to execute on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Now have our second reading. A reading from the, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities have existed have been instituted, that exist, have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good, for it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, 
for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due to them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honour to whom honour is due. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the word, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 18, beginning at the 10th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Take care that you, not, that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if a member of the church sins against you, And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, Take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to you, take them, uh, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So this morning you're in for a treat. Uh, I'm not preaching, uh, so you can be thankful. Um, (laughs) A true story. That is a true story. Um, I just wanted to make one sort of quick reflection because I can't help myself. It always interests me that... um, uh, in that piece of scripture, Jesus talks, you know, if, if they don't even listen to the church, let them be like tax collectors, you know, and um, sinners to you. But what did Jesus do with the tax collectors and the Pharisees? He sat down with them and he ate with them. He spent time with them. You know, he found it extremely important to get the message out to them as well. So I thought I'd just throw that out there before we hear something far more important. So uh, over the last few months before COVID, we, we asked a few people to give their testimony. Remember that? They would share their journey with Christ with us. And that's always a blessing to have people amongst us be so willing and courageous uh, to offer their journey with Christ. Most of the time, uh, people will come up the front and, and present that personally. But 
Luckily today we have the gift of technology. We have so many different ways that we can do this. Uh, and so uh, I asked Josiah if he would be happy to do that for us. And uh, graciously he offered to do so, which is great. But he's done so by recording it uh, at home. And there's a few things in this video too that you might be interested to see, a couple of old photos and things. So we're extremely grateful for Josiah to share with us uh, his spiritual journey and give a bit of a testimony. So let us pray uh, for Josiah before we begin. Loving God, we give you great thanks for all of the saints of this church. We thank you for our community here at Freshwater. And especially this morning, we give you great thanks for the witness and ministry that Josiah has in our church. May we be inspired by his spiritual journey. May we listen intently to how God has worked in his life. And may we reflect on ways that we may see God working in ours. So we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Hi, my name's Josiah. This is a reflection of my spiritual journey. I've always had faith in God, as did my parents, my mum used to bring my brother and me to church at St. Matthew's every Sunday in Deception Bay, which in 1993 relocated to a newly constructed building, becoming the Church of the Risen Christ in the parish of Freshwater, Deception Bay. Around the time the then minister, Ron Grigg, was transferred to another parish, our attendance diminished eventually to little more than special occasions such as Easter and Christmas. During high school, my Christianity took something of a backseat role in my life. I had my faith, but I didn't really live it out that much. After completing Year 12 at Redcliffe State High School, I applied for and was granted a disability support pension for which I am very grateful. Sadly, my working capacity has always been somewhat limited, but I give to my community what I can. Among other things, I suffer generalised anxiety. This comes into play on my spiritual journey. Although I have always had some degree of faith, my spiritual journey was yet to truly begin. I developed a modest prayer life, hoping to find signs, but with no idea how to recognize one if I saw it. The first sign that I did recognize from God, I believe, came after praying for guidance on showing my dedication to Christ. The simple suggestion of finding alternatives to computer gaming on Sundays was the first sign I acted on. This remains a rule to which I adhere today. I thought I was showing dedication to serving the Lord, but perhaps the Lord was actually helping me and serving me, as this practice has proven very healthy. After reading the Gospel of Matthew in a very literal context and becoming gripped with pure fear over the thought of hellfire, I attempted to achieve perfection. This mistake, I suspect, is one made by many people. Being affected by generalized anxiety disorder, this was not going to bring me closer to God. I have since realized how little I truly knew the Lord. All of these things precede perhaps one of the single biggest changes to come in my life. In 2008, after finding love online, I moved out of my mum's home with a day's notice and into the private rental market with my new partner, who'd just moved from New Zealand to live with me. Sadly, this love was not to last. In 2015, I opened a letter from my mailbox, which brought me to my knees. The love of my life no longer loved me and was not coming home. 
To this day, hearing the sound of the postie's bike still triggers anxiety. Since that time, I've battled with suicidal depression. At its peak, I've awakened each day disappointed to still be among the living. I prayed that I might die in my sleep. Who'd have guessed that this would lead me to the beginning of my new journey with Christ? A year passed, but with God's help, I forgave her for the way I was betrayed. God implanted the notion of regular church attendance. With each prayer, this notion grew stronger in me. So, I visited the Redcliffe Uniting Church, where I eventually made a new friend. Indeed, it took crippling heartbreak for the Lord to get my attention. It's very important to note at this point that my impression of church-going Christians was not favourable. For sure, we've all encountered the type of Christian who appears to think themselves somehow a cut above others for their faith. I had no intention of becoming a churchy and aimed to distance myself from these people, one of whom I later became. Needless to say, my initial impression of this church was sceptical. I perceived this place as soft, dull and pretentious, desperately trying to be modern and, dare I say it, cool. I still thought of my attendance as a chore, but again I was wrong. I started to find inspiration from these people from whom I had so desperately tried to distance myself. In fact, I became friends with a man whose friendship has been one of the most rewarding friendships of all. This friend, of course, is Eli. And thanks to him, I have answered questions I never realised I had. I've learned about LGBTIQ Christians and have even become an advocate for wider spread acceptance. I started to get involved with more activities such as meeting with equal voices and visiting the Metropolitan Community Church, affectionately known by some as the Gay Church. The first equal voices meeting I attended was at Freshwater, where I met the Reverend Clay among other amazing Christians. Such has been the inspiration I gained that after recording the spiritual testimony delivered by Eli in this church and the suggestion being raised, I began recording all of the sermons and presentations so that more people can gain insight and inspiration as I have done. In the days that followed a horrific attack against innocent people whose faith is often misrepresented, I found myself very upset by a man whose attitude reflected the very ignorance and fear that has caused violence and unrest in the world throughout. With what little strength I still possessed during a truly crippling anxiety attack, I confided in Clay via text message. He assured me of his prayers. It was at this point I immediately felt the presence of God in my heart, and the Lord clarified for me the truth. I saw my own negative potential in this troubled man, and if not for the gracious gifts of learning opportunities... I too could have been as ignorant and uncharitable. After all, for years, I held a negative impression of people, one of whom I would eventually become. God took the pain from my heart and reduced it to little more than a mild discomfort. My life now is littered with 
examples such as this because God has my attention so I may hear his often quiet and softly spoken voice. This is not to say that I do not have my problems. I just know that I'm never alone with them. Such has been the inspiration that I've gained, I felt inclined to tell this true story, so that it may be shared with others for what good may come of it. I used to despise the churchy types, and now I seem to be one. How the tables have turned. Thank you.